All right, let's get started, folks. <clears throat> Fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, if, if you take calculus, you will learn the fundamental theorem of calculus, and that fundamental theorem of algebra and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, probably the only ones that, uh, that you get to learn in school. There are other fundamental theorems. Those are really the, the three big ones. Um, but before we start talking about the fundamental theorem of algebra, I have a question. Is 3 a complex number? So can we can we write three as in in a, in standard form a plus b i three equals three plus zero i so real numbers real numbers are complex numbers. So if we drew uh, a set or a Venn diagram, it would look like this. The reals are in here, and complex are out here. So the real numbers are, um, the con are contained in the set of complex numbers. So that's important for, for what we're going to say about the fundamental theorem of algebra. <clears throat> All right, so now that we have that, I'm just going to write FTA for Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. Uh, fundamental Theorem of Algebra says if f of x is a polynomial, um, with degree n, so that's the highest power on our variable, where n is greater than 0. So it's not that interesting if our highest power on our variable is 0. Then f of x has at least one zero in the complex numbers. And I'm going to put in parentheses, the zero may be repeated. And the reason that we say that is we could have something like our polynomial could be f of x equals x minus 3 to the 10th power, for example. This one has. 1, 0, x equals 3, but it's repeated 10 times. So it doesn't, this doesn't seem like a, a, a really big deal. But essentially what the fundamental theorem of algebra says is now that we have complex numbers, we know about complex numbers, we can find the solution to any polynomial. So before we, we left out the complex solution, adding the complex numbers is enough to give us a solution of every possible polynomial that we can think of. Now the more interesting piece from, that follows along from the fundamental theorem of algebra is the linear factorization theorem. And the linear factorization theorem says, starts off the same way, if f of x is a polynomial, Hello. Mm -hmm. with degree n greater than 0, Then our function has exactly n linear factors.
So what we're saying is f of x we can write as x minus c1, x minus c2, dot, 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 times x minus cn. I'm going to put it a sub n. We can have a leading coefficient. And this means we have n parentheses. So that means if we have a fifth degree polynomial with the complex numbers, we can factor that into five sets of parentheses. And here we're saying the C1, C2, dot, 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 Cn are complex. So they can be real numbers. Real numbers are complex numbers. So this says we can break any polynomial into a set of parentheses x minus something, x minus something else. The exact same number of parentheses as the degree of the polynomial. So this is related to the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and the unique factorization theorem there. Anybody know what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells us? And the unique factorization theorem? You probably know what you you know what it mean, what it tells us. You just probably haven't heard it called that. The unique factorization theorem and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tell us that we can break any integer into factors of primes. So that's the that's the unique factorization theorem and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So the complex numbers act kind of like prime numbers for polynomials. With the complex numbers. We, we have enough numbers to find the solution to any polynomial, and we can write a polynomial as factors with complex numbers in there. So it's, it's a pretty big, pretty big result. It tells us something about the relationship to complex numbers and polynomials. Complex numbers are enough to solve any polynomial. So what we're going to do with this is really, it's not any different than what we've been doing. It's just that when we do our division looking for zero remainders, once we get to a quadratic polynomial, then we can use the, the quadratic formula and find our complex roots. Well, let me write something else down here. If ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, so we have a quadratic polynomial. Quadratic formula tells us this x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And we, we talked about this when we talked about Descartes' rule of signs. When this square root is negative, we end up with negative b plus i times the square root of something, negative b minus i times the square root of something. Complex roots always occur in conjugate pairs. So it's impossible to get one complex number as a root for a polynomial. They always show up in pairs. And the pairs are always conjugate. And that's why in Descartes' rule of signs, we, we count the sign changes, and then we go down by a multiple of two. Because we can get two complex roots. We can get four complex roots. We can get six. But we can't get three. So they always occur in pairs. So we're going to use these ideas to find all the zeros of a polynomial, find all the factors of a polynomial, where some of them can be complex. All right, questions? OK, let's look at an example.
We're, we want to find all zeros of um, f of x equals x to the fourth minus 3x to the third plus x minus 3. And did I tell you, I had a lot of, a lot of trouble this weekend because I was thinking a lot about whether I am the square root of negative 1 or I is the square root of negative 1. <laughs> All right. So for this problem, when we see a problem like this, we should already, the dumpster should already be smoldering. What do we, what do we do? We need to find our, we need to find our P's and our Q's. We could factor by grouping, but we'd still end up having to find P's and Q's. All right, so our possible possible rational roots. It's nice that our Q is just 1, so we just get plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 3. Let's do Descartes' rule of signs. I'm just going to say DRS. How many sign changes do we have here? 1, 2, 3. 3 or 1, positive. Real roots. And F of minus X <coughs> Change the, change the sign on the odd powers. We get x to the fourth plus x to the third minus x minus 3. So we have one sign change. So we have one negative real root. Well, what, what number would be nice if it were the one negative real root? Negative 1. Let's try negative 1. So f of negative 1 is... 1, we change the sign on the odd powers, plus 3, minus 1, minus 3, which is 0. Which is zero. So we, have a, we know that's a root. So that's the, the first number we're going to do synthetic division with. So we're going to do a negative 1, do our synthetic division, 1, negative 3, put a placeholder in for the x squared, and we'll do our synthetic division. Zero. So there's our remainder. We knew our remainder should be zero. Um, and now we have a cubic polynomial. What would be nice if it were a positive root? We could try one. Let's try f of one here, just to see if that's one of the positive ones. f of one is one minus three plus one minus three. Is that zero? Not equal zero. So what's the next one we want to try? Positive three. We found our one negative one already. We don't have to find any more negative. So let's try three here. One, three, negative one, negative three, one, three, zero. There's our remainder. Awesome. So that tells us that f of x equals x plus one x minus 3 times x squared minus x plus 1. Can we factor x squared minus x plus 1? No. So we need to use a quadratic formula. We want to find all the real zeros, or all the zeros. And we want to write the complete factorization, now that we know our complex numbers. Use a quadratic formula here, and you would see that x equals um, 1 plus or minus i square root 3 over 2. So our factorization is 
x plus 1, x minus 3, x minus 1 plus i square root 3 over 2, and x minus 1 minus i square root 3 over 2. That would be our complete factorization and our zeros. Our zeros are x equals negative 1, x equals 3, and x equals 1 plus or minus i square root 3 over 2. Those are our four zeros. Fourth degree polynomial, we have, expect four zeros. Some of them may be repeated. One negative, one positive, two complex. All right, so the only thing that we're adding here is once we get to here, we're going to use the quadratic formula to find our remaining zeros and, our, and write our, our polynomial as linear factors. All right, questions there. Okay, let me let's talk about a couple of different types of questions you you might be asked now. Let's find a fourth degree polynomial with um, zero. 1 and i as zeros. Well, how many zeros should a fourth degree polynomial have? Four. four. We have three of them here. How can we find that fourth one? Well, what does this tell us? The, so, negative i is also a zero. Does complex zeros have to appear in conjugate pairs? So my fourth degree polynomial is f of x equals x minus zero. So I can just write x. x minus one, x minus i, x plus i. And that would be enough to write your fourth degree polynomial. If you multiplied this out, you'd have a fourth degree polynomial with all real coefficients. This is fine for me. What if I added to this problem that we wanted it to go through the point 0.25? We're going to plug that in, but what we're going to say is y equals, we could have a leading coefficient, a, x, x minus 1, x minus i, and x plus i. This gives me an x and a y. So what I'm going to do is plug this in. 5 equals a times 2 times 2 minus 1 times 2 minus i times 2 plus i, and I'm going to solve for a. So you multiply all this out, you get something times a equals 5, and solve for a. So the key for this one is realizing that we can have a leading coefficient there. And that's how we get it to go through a specific point. All right, questions. Okay, I want to do one other example, so a problem slight, s s related to this one, but just a little bit different. All right. 
what if we had a polynomial x to the fourth minus 4x to the third plus 12x squared plus 4x minus 13. And we want to find all the zeros. given that 2 plus 3i is a 0. We know that the conjugate is also a 0. 2 minus 3i is also a 0. If this first number was just 2, given that 2 was a 0, what would we do then? Negative. Uh, so for a conjugate, you change the sign on the complex part. But just in general, we had a problem where we wanted to find all the zeros, and we're given one of them. What do we do? What do we normally do then? Synthetic division. You could do synthetic division with 2 plus 3i. It's, you're just multiplying and adding, but you have to multiply the complex numbers. It's doable. It's not too bad. The other thing that you could do is uh, do your plus and minus, your, your p's and your q's. But I want to show you a slightly different way. I'm going to say that x minus 2 plus 3i times x minus 2 minus 3i is a factor. So I can multiply the two factors together and get a factor. When I multiply those together, I get that this equals x squared minus 4x plus 13. So when I, when I FOIL this out, multiply this out, I get x squared minus 4x plus 13. Well, since this is a factor, if I divide by this, my remainder is going to be 0, and I'll have another factor. So we're going to do long division. Because we don't want to miss out on a chance to do long division. All right, so let's, um, let's do this long division. What do I multiply x squared by to get x to the fourth? x squared. Multiply this out, you get x squared minus 4x to the third plus 13x squared. And we're going to subtract. Those go away, those go away. I get minus x squared. This has three terms, so I'm going to bring down 4x minus 13. I need to divide three terms into three terms. <coughs> and now, what do I multiply x squared by to get negative x squared? Negative 1 minus x squared plus 4x minus 13. And when I subtract here, what do I get? 0, 0 remainder. So that tells us that f of x equals x squared minus 4x plus 13 times x squared minus 1. Can I factor x squared minus 1? Yes. Yeah. x plus 1, x minus 1. So my zeros are x equals 2 plus or minus 3i, and x equals plus or minus 1. And my factorization would be, if I wanted the complete factorization, x minus 2 plus 3i, x minus 2 minus 3i, times x plus 1 times x minus 1. That would be our, the complete factorization. All right, isn't that nice? Yep. Okay, questions?
Did I did I tell you about my son and his that told me he had an imaginary friend? I said, how do you know your friend's imaginary? He said, because when I multiply by the conjugate, he turns real. Yeah. Yeah, he, he talks about you, Aiden. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Skip 29 there, every other odd. All right, there you go.